Chapter Two of Curiosities of Olden Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gold. Chapter Two Curiosities of Cipher. In 1680, when Monsieur de Louvois was French minister of war, he summoned before him one day a gentleman called Chamilly, and gave him the following instructions. Start this evening for Basel in Switzerland. You will reach it in three days. On the fourth, punctually at two o'clock, station yourself on the bridge over the Rhine, with a portfolio, ink, and a pen. Watch all that takes place, and make a memorandum of every particular. Continue doing so for two hours. Have a carriage and post-horses awaiting you, and at four precisely mount, and travel night and day till you reach Paris. On the instant of your arrival, hasten to me with your notes. De Chamilly obeyed. He reached Basel, and on the day and at the hour appointed, stationed himself, pen in hand, on the bridge. Presently a market-cart drives by. Then an old woman with a basket of fruit passes. And noon a little urchin trundles his hoop by. Next an old gentleman in blue top-coat jogs past on his grey mare. Three o'clock chimes from the cathedral tower. Just at the last stroke, a tall fellow in yellow waistcoat and breeches saunters up, goes to the middle of the bridge, lounges over, and looks at the water. Then he takes a step back and strikes three hearty blows on the footway with his staff. Down goes every detail in the Chamilly's book. At last the hour of release sounds, and he jumps into his carriage. Shortly before midnight, after two days of ceaseless travelling, de Chamilly presents himself before the minister, feeling rather ashamed at having such trifles to record. Monsieur de Lavoie took the portfolio with eagerness, and glanced over the notes. As his eye caught the mention of the yellow-breeched man, a gleam of joy flashed across his countenance. He rushed to the king, roused him from sleep, spoke in private with him for a few moments, and then four couriers, who had been held in readiness since five on the preceding evening, were dispatched with haste. Eight days after, the town of Strasbourg, was entirely surrounded by French troops, and summoned to surrender. It capitulated and threw open its gate on the 30th of September, 1681. Evidently the three strokes of the stick, given by the fellow in the yellow costume, at an appointed hour, were the signal of the success of an intrigue concerted between Monsieur de Lourois and the magistrates of Strasbourg, and the man who executed this mission was as ignorant of the motive as Monsieur de Chamilly of the motive of his. Now this is a specimen of the safest of all secret communications, but it can only be resorted to on certain rare occasions. When a lengthy dispatch is required to be forwarded, and when such means as those given above are out of the question, some other method must be employed. Herodotus gives us a story to the point. It is found also with variations in Aulus Gellius. Quote, Histiaeus, when he was anxious to give Aristagoras orders to revolt, could find but one safe way, as the roads were guarded, of making his wishes known, which was by taking the trustiest of his slaves, shaving all the hair from off his head, and then pricking letters upon the skin, and waiting till the hair grew again. This accordingly he did, and as soon as ever the hair was grown, he dispatched a man to Miletus, giving him no other message than this, When thou art come to Miletus, bid Aristagoras shave thy head, and look thereon. Now the marks on the head were a command to revolt. End quote. B. K. V. 35. In this case no cipher was employed. We shall come now to the use of ciphers. When a dispatch or communication runs great risk of falling into the hands of an enemy, it is necessary that its contents should be so wheeled that the possession of the document may afford him no information whatever. Julius Caesar and Augustus used ciphers, 
but they were of the utmost simplicity, as they consisted merely in placing D in the place of A, E in that of B, and so on, or else in writing B for A, C for B, etc. Secret characters were used at the Council of Nicaea, and Rabanus Maurus, abbot of Fulda, and archbishop of Mayens in the ninth century, has left us an example of two ciphers, the key to which was discovered by the Benedictines. It is only a wonder that any one could have failed to unravel them at the first glance. This is a specimen of the first. Dot, capital N, C, dot, P, dot, T. V, colon, R, S, colon, dot, colon, S. Capital B, colon, colon, N, dot, F, colon, C, dot, dot. Colon, R, C, H, dot. G, L, colon, colon, R, dot, colon, colon, S, dot, Q, colon, dot, colon, colon. M colon R T dot R dot S. The secret of this is that the vowels have been suppressed and their places filled by dots, one for I, two for A, three for E, four for O, and five for U. In the second example, the same sentence would run capital K N C K P K T V F R S X S capital B, P, N, K, F, B, C, K, K, etc., the vowel places being filled by the consonants B, F, K, P, X. By changing every letter in the alphabet, we make a vast improvement on this last. Thus, for instance, supplying the place of an A with Z, B with X, C with V, and so on. This is the system employed by an advertiser in a provincial paper which I took up the other day in the waiting-room of a station, where it had been left by a farmer. As I had some minutes to spare before the train was due, I spent them in deciphering the following. Capital J, P. Capital S, J, D, D, J, Z, B. R, Z, A. R, Z, D, D. C, I. S I J M R, comma, capital B Z I W, R Z D D, X R, N D Z T, colon. And in ten minutes I read, if William can call or write, Mary will be glad. A correspondence was carried on in the Times during May eighteen sixty two in cipher. I give it along with the explanation. WWS dot dash capital Z Y capital E F P D O L J capital T D P Y E L W P E E P C E Z M J C Y P Q said C. J said F dash X L J. Capital T. D A P L Y. Q F W W J. Said Y. L W W. X L E E P C D. L E. E S P. T Y E P C G T P H question mark capital T E X L J O Z R Z Z O dot capital E C F D E E Z X J W Z G P dash capital T L X X T D P C L M W P dot Capital H S P Y X L J Capital T R Z E Z Capital N L Y E P C M F C J T Q 
Z Y W J E Z W Z Z V L E J Z F dot dash May eighth. This means quote, on Tuesday I sent a letter to Burn for you. May I speak fully on all matters at the interview? It may do good. Trust to my love. I am miserable. When may I go to Canterbury if only to look at you? End quote. A couple of days later, Byrne advertises, slightly varying the cipher, www.s.slash, capital S, X H R D K T G, H D B T E W X C V, double quote, capital T, M W X Q X I X D C, A X Z T, and double quote. U D G. P C T E W T G. P S K T G E X H T B T C E. Dot dot dot. Capital Q. Capital N. Capital G. Capital C. Capital T. Dot. Double quote. Discover something exhibition like for another advertisement. Burn. End quote. This gentleman is rather mysterious. I must leave my readers to conjecture what he means by quote, exhibition like. End quote. On Wednesday came two advertisements one from the lady, one from the lover. W. W. S. herself seems rather sensible. Tide plow. Said Q. R said T Y R E said N L Y E P C M F C J comma capital T E S T Y V J said F S L O X F N S M P E E P C D E L J L E S Z X P L Y O X T Y O J Z F C M F D T Y P D D dot dash W W S May tenth Quote Instead of going to Canterbury I think you had much better stay at home and mind your business End quote. Excellent advice, but how far likely to be taken by the eager wooer who advertises thus W W S dot dash capital F Y E T W J Z F C Q L E S P C L Y D H P C D capital T H Z Y E L D V J Z F E Z A C Z G P J Z F W Z G P X P dot Capital E F P D O L J Y T R S E L E Z Y P Z N W Z N V S L G P Capital I D E C T Y R Q C Z X E S P H T Y O Z H Q Z C W P E E P C D dot Capital T Q J Z T L C P Y Z E L M W P L E Z Y P Capital T H T W W H L T E dot Capital R Z O N Z X Q Z C E J Z F X J O L C W T Y R H T Q P dot quote, until your father answers, I want to ask you to prove you love me. Tuesday night at one o'clock have a string from the window for letters. If you are not able at one I will wait. God comfort you, my darling wife. End quote. 
only a very simple romeo and juliet could expect to secure secrecy by so slight a displacement of the alphabet when the chevalier de rohan was in bastille his friends wanted to convey to him the intelligence that his accomplice was dead without having confessed they did so by passing the following words into his dungeon written on a shirt quote, capital m g d u l h x c c l g u g h j y x u j semicolon l m c t u l g c a l j dot end quote in vain did he puzzle over the cipher to which he had not the clue it was too short for the shorter a cipher letter the more difficult it is to make out the light faded and he tossed on his hard bed sleeplessly revolving the mystic letters in his brain but he could make nothing out of them day dawned and with this first gleam he was poring over them still in vain he pleaded guilty for he could not decipher le prisonnier est mort il n'en rien dit end quote. another method of revealing a communication is that of employing numbers or arbitrary signs in the place of letters and this admits of many refinements here is an example to test the reader's sagacity double s break cross four three one break four five break two plus nine break plus double s five one break four equals break eight seven three two plus break two eight seven break four five break two plus nine break cross backwards p equals plus i just give the hint that it is a proverb the following is much more ingenious and difficult of detection a form with frames horizontal a b c d e f g h and vertical a b c red horizontal line one a d g k n q t x line two b e h l o r u y line three c f i m p s w z now suppose that i want to write england i look among the small letters in the foregoing table for e and i find that it is in a horizontal line with b and a vertical line with b so i write down b b n is in line with a and e so i put a e continue this and england will be represented by b b a e a c b d a a a e a b two letters to represent one is not over tedious but the scheme devised by lord bacon is clumsy enough he represented every letter by permutations of a and b for instance a was written a a a a a b was written a a a a b c was written a a a b a d was written a a b a a and so through the alphabet paris would thus be transformed into a b b b a a a a a a b a a a a a b a a a b a a a b conceive the labour of composing a whole dispatch like this and the great likelihood of making blunders in writing it a much simpler method is the following the sender and receiver of the communication must be agreed upon a certain book of specified edition the dispatch begins with a number this indicates the page to which the reader is to turn he must then count the letters from the top of the page and give them their value numerical according to the order in which they come omitting those which are repeated by these numbers he reads his dispatch as an example let us take the beginning of this article then i equals one n equals two w equals three h equals four e equals five m equals six d equals seven l equals eight o equals nine u equals ten v equals eleven omitting to count the letters which are repeated in the middle of the communication the page may be varied 
and consequently the numerical significance of each letter altered. Even this could be read with a little trouble, and the word impossible can hardly be said to apply to the deciphering of cryptographs. A curious instance of this occurred at the close of the sixteenth century, when the Spaniards were endeavouring to establish relations between the scattered branches of their vast monarchy, which at that period embraced a large portion of Italy, the Low Countries, the Philippines, and enormous districts in the New World. They accordingly invented a cipher, which they varied from time to time in order to disconcern those who might attempt to pry into the mysteries of their correspondence. The cipher, composed of fifty signs, was of great value to them through all the troubles of the League, and the wars then desolating Europe. Some of their dispatches having been intercepted, Henry the Fourth handed them over to a clever mathematician, Viette, with a request that he would find the clue. He did so, and was able also to follow it as it varied, and France profited for two years by his discovery. The court of Spain, disconcerned at this, accused Viette before the Roman court as a sorcerer, and in league with the devil. This proceeding only gave rise to laughter and ridicule. A still more remarkable instance is that of a German professor, Hermann, who boasted, in 1752, that he had discovered a cryptograph absolutely incapable of being deciphered, without a clue being given by him, and he defied all the savants and learned societies of Europe to discover the key. However, a French refugee named Beguelin managed after eight days' study to read it. This cipher, though we have the rules upon which it is formed before us, is to us perfectly unintelligible. It is grounded on some changes of numbers and symbols. Numbers vary, being at one time multiplied, at another added, and become so complicated that the letter E, which occurs nine times in the paragraph, is represented in eight different ways. N is used eight times, and has seven various signs. Indeed, the same letter is scarcely ever represented by the same figure. But this is not all. The character which appears in the place of I takes that of N shortly after. Another symbol for N stands also for T. How any man could have solved the mystery of this cipher is astonishing. Now let me recommend a far simpler system, and one which is very difficult of detection. It consists of a combination of numbers and letters. Both parties must be agreed on an arrangement, such as that in the second line below, for on it all depends. Vertical, line 1, 1, 4, line 2, 2, 7, line 3, 3, 2, line 4, 4, 9, line 5, 5, 1. Line six, six ten, line seven, seven five, line eight, eight three, line nine, nine six, line ten, ten eight. Now, in turning a sentence such as the army must retire into cipher, you count the letters which make the sentence and find that T is the first, H the second, E the third, A the fourth, R the fifth, and so on. Then look at the table. T is the first letter. 4 answers to 1, therefore write the fourth letter in the place of T. That is A instead of T. For H, the second, put the seventh, which is Y. For E, take the second, H. The sentence will stand A Y H U T S R E M M A Y H U T S R. It is all but impossible to discover this cipher. All these cryptographs consist in the exchange of numbers or characters for the real letters. But there are other methods, quite as intricate, which dispense with them. The mysterious parts of the Count de Vergennes are an instance. De Vergennes was Minister of Foreign Affairs under Louis the Sixteenth, and he made use of cards of a peculiar nature in his relations with the diplomatic agents of France. These cards were used in letters of recommendation or passports, which were given to strangers about to enter France. They were intended to furnish information without the knowledge of the bearers. This was the system. The card given to a man contained only a few words, such as Alphonse d'Anguia, recommandé à Monsieur le Comte de Vachennes par le Marquis de P. 
Croix-Sigur, ambassadeur de France à la Cour de Lisbonne. The card told more tales than the words written on it. Its color indicated the nation of the stranger. Yellow showed him to be English, red Spanish, white Portuguese, green Dutch, red and white Italian, red and green Swiss, green and white Russian, etc. The person's age was expressed by the shape of the card. If it was circular, he was under twenty-five, oval between twenty-five and thirty, octagonal between thirty and forty-five, hexagonal between forty-five and fifty, square between fifty and sixty, and oblong showed that he was over sixty. Two lines placed below the name of the bearer indicated his build. If he were tall and lean, the lines were waving and parallel. Tall and stout, they converged, and so on. The expression of his face was shown by a flower in the border, a rose designated an open and admirable countenance, whilst the tulip mark a pensive and aristocratic appearance. A fillet around the border, according to its length, told whether the man was bachelor, married, or widower. Dots gave information as to his position and fortune. A full stop after his name showed that he was a Catholic. A semicolon, that he was a Lutheran. A comma, that he was a Calvinist. A dash, that he was a Jew. No stop indicated him as an atheist. So also his morals and character were pointed out by a pattern in the angles of the card, such as one of these. Dash, colon, dash, squiggly dash, plus plus, plus plus, plus plus, squiggly dash, squiggly dash, left cross, right cross, three stars, square. Consequently, at one glance, the minister could tell all about this man, whether he were a gamester or a duelist, what was his purpose in visiting France, whether in search of a wife or to claim a legacy, what was his profession, that of physician, lawyer, or man of letters, whether he were to be put under surveillance or allowed to go his way unmolested. We come now to parts of cipher which requires a certain amount of literary dexterity to conceal the clue. During the Great Rebellion, Sir John Trevanion, a distinguished cavalier, was made prisoner and locked up in Colchester Castle. Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle had just been made examples of, as a warning to malignants, and Trevanion has every reason for expecting a similar bloody end, as he awaits his doom, indulging in a hearty curse in round cavalier terms at the canting, crop-eared scoundrels who hold them in durance while, and muttering our wish that he had fallen, sword in hand, facing the foe, he is startled by the entrance of the gaulier, who hands him a letter. "'Make to the good,' growls the fellow. "'It has been well looked to before it was permitted to come to-day.' Sir John takes the letter, and the gaoler leaves him his lamp by which to read it. Worthy Sir John, Hope, that is, Y.E., best a comfort of Y.E., afflicted, cannot much, I fear me, help you now, that I volde say to you, is this only, if ever I may be able to requite that I do owe you, stand not upon asking of me. Tis not much I can do, but what I can do, be your very sure I villa. I know that, if death here comes, if ordinary men fear it, it frights not you, accounting it for a higher honour, to have such a reward eh, of your loyalty. Pray yet that you may be spared this so bitter cup. I fear not that you will grudge any sufferings, only if be a submission you can turn them away, tis the part of a wiser man. Tell me, and if you can, to do for you anything uh, that you will to have done. The general goes back on Wednesday. Resting your servant to command. R.T. Now this letter was written according to preconcerted cipher. Every third letter after a stop was to tell. In this way Sir John made out, panel at east end of chapel slides. On the following even, the prisoner begged to be allowed to pass an hour of private devotion in the chapel. By means of a bribe, this was accomplished. Before the hour had expired, the chapel was empty. The bird had flown. An excellent plan of indicating the telling letter or word 
is through the heading of the letter. Sir would signify that every third letter was to be taken. Dear sir, that every seventh. My dear sir, that every ninth was to be selected. A system very early adopted was that of having pierced cards, through the holes of which the communication was written. The card was then removed, and the blank spaces filled up, as for example, my dear X left square bracket, the right square bracket, lines are now send you are forwarded by the kindness of the left square bracket bearer, right square bracket, who is a friend. Left square bracket is not right square bracket, the message delivered yet, left square bracket to right square bracket, my brother, left square bracket be right square bracket quick about it for i have all along left square bracket trusted right square bracket that you would act with discretion and dispatch yours ever z put your card over the note and through the piercings you will read the bearer is not to be trusted the following letter will give two totally distinct meanings according as it is read straight through or only by alternate lines. Mademoiselle, je me presse de voir écrire pour vous déclarer que vous vous trompez beaucoup si vous croyez que vous êtes celle pour qui je soupire. Il est bien vrai que pour vous et pour je vous ai fait mille aveux, après quoi vous êtes devenu l'objet de ma ralière. Ainsi ne doutez plus de ce que vous dites ici celui qui n'a que de la version pour voir et qui aimerait mourir que de se voir obligé et de jonguer le désir qu'il a formé de vous et toute sa vie, bien loin de voir amer comme il veut la déclarer. Soyez donc désabusé, croyez-moi. Et si vous êtes encore constante et persuadée que vous et M, vous serez encore plus exposé à la risée de tout le monde, et particulièrement de celui qui n'a jamais été et ne serait jamais votre certe M. N. We must not omit to mention chronograms. These are verses which contain within them the date of the composition. In 1885, I built a boathouse by a lake in my grounds. A friend wrote the following chronogram for it, which I had painted, and affixed to the house. Thy bread upon the waters cast, insert a in, trust to find. Since, well thou knowest, God's eye doth mark, where fishes' eyes are blind. This gives the date. D equals five hundred plus W equals five ten plus C equals six ten plus I equals six eleven plus C equals seven eleven plus I equals seven twelve plus I equals seven thirteen plus I equals seven fourteen plus C equals eight fourteen plus W equals eight twenty four plus M equals eighteen twenty four plus W equals eighteen thirty four plus I equals eighteen thirty five plus L equals eighteen eighty five. The W represent two V's, i.e. ten. A very curious one was written by Charles de Beauvel. We adapt and explain it. The heads of a mouse and five cats. M dot C C C C C. Add also the tail of a bull. L item the four legs of a rat i i i i and you have my date in full m dot c c c c c l i i i i fifteen fifty four it is now high time that we show the reader how to find the clue to a cipher and as illustration is always better than preset we shall exemplify from our own experience with permission to we shall drop the plural for the singular. Well, my friend Matthew Fletcher came into a property some years ago, bequeathed to him by a great uncle. The old gentleman had been notorious for his parsimonious habits, and he was known through the country by the nickname of Miser Tom, 
Of course every one believed that he was vastly rich, and that Matt Fletcher would come in for a mint of money. But somehow my friend did not find the stores of coin on which he had calculated, hidden in worsted stockings or cracked pots, and the savings of the old man which he did light upon consisted of but trifling sums. Fletcher became firmly persuaded that the money was hidden somewhere, where he, where he could not tell, and he often came to consult me on the best expedient for discovering it. It was all through my intervention that he did not pull down the whole house about his ears, tear up every floor, and root up every flower or tree throughout the garden, in his search after the precious hoard. One day he burst into my room with radiant face. "'My dear fellow!' he gasped forth. "'I have found it!' "'Found what? The treasure?' "'No, but I want your help now.' And he flung a discoloured slip of paper on my table. I took it up and saw that it was covered with writing in cipher. "'I routed it out of a secret drawer in Uncle Tom's bureau,' he exclaimed. "'I have no doubt of its purport. It indicates the spot where all his savings are secreted. You have not deciphered it yet, have you?' "'No, I want your help. I can make neither heads nor tails of the scroll, though I sat up all night studying it.' "'Come along,' said I. "'I wish you joy of your treasure. I'll read the cipher if you give me time.' So we sat down together at my desk, with a slip of paper before us. Here is the inscription. Plus Lambda 282 Double S 9 Beta 9 Beta Two, lambda, chi, eight seven nine, plus right parenthesis seven eight nine, left parenthesis nine, left parenthesis eight eight, backwards p seven, division, right parenthesis, d over eight dash two double s plus nine, times double s two double s dash two nine double s dash right parenthesis alpha over star eight two two eight chi seven lambda theta eight two lambda star nine chi seven nine plus times double s dash seven dash beta star gamma chi nine dash backwards p Beta dash chi eight right parenthesis lambda times eight pipe pipe double s eight dash equals beta over eight chi two double s eight chi eight two double s dash plus double s eight chi eight cross double s eight chi eight two double s eight two eight g seven beta lambda left parenthesis two double s eight plus eight pipe pipe g lambda equals lambda backwards p nine beta pipe pipe lambda seven equals dash plus division dash g eight eight i lambda g star nine two dash plus two now said i the order of proceeding among the letters according to the frequency of their recurrence is this e a o i t d h n r s u y c f g l m w b k p q x z this however is their order according to the number of words begun by each respectively s c p a d i f b l b t etc. The most frequent compounds are th, ng, ee, ll, mm, tt, dd, nn. Pray, Matthew, do you see any one sign repeating oftener than the others in this cryptograph? Yes, eight. It is repeated twenty-three times, said Fletcher after a pause. Then you may be perfectly satisfied that it stands for e, which is used far oftener than any other letter in English. Next, look along the lines and see what letters most frequently accompany it. Two double S, undoubtedly, 
it follows eight in several places, and precedes it in others. In the third line we have two double s eight dash eight two double s dash double s eight dash eight double s eight, and then two double s eight again. Then we may fairly assume that two double s eight stands for the. The to be sure, burst forth Fletcher. Now the next word will be money. No, it can't be. The E will not suit. Perhaps it is treasure, gold, hoard, store. Wait a little bit, I interposed. Now look what letters are doubled. Eighty-eight and twenty-two, said my friend Matt. And please observe, I continued, that where I draw a line and write A, you have E, then double T, then E again. Probably this is the middle of a word, and as we have already supposed two to stand for T, we have ete, a very likely combination. We may be sure of the T now. Near the end of the third line, there is a remarkable passage in which the three letters we know recur continually. Let us write it out, leaving blanks for the letter we do not know, and placing the certain letters instead of their symbols. Then it stands E G V G E T H dash H E G E H E G break E T H E dash now here i have a g repeated four times and from its position it must be a consonant i will put in its place one consonant after another you see r is the only one which turns the letter into words dash ethereth dash hair dot hair thee dash surely some of these should stand out distinctly separated dash e r there th dash hair dot hair thee look i can see at once what letters are wanting th between there and here must be a then and then cross here is must be where so now i have found these letters h equals e r equals t double s equals h g equals r dash equals a plus equals n cross equals w and I can confer the chi as R by taking the portion marked A dash eta. Here we get an end of an adjective in the comparative degree. I think it must be better. Let us next take a group of ciphers higher up. I will pencil over it D. I will take this group because it contains some of the letters which we have settled. Dash Eathen. Eath must be the end of a word for none begins with an athen, thn, or hn. Now what letter will suit eth? Possibly h, probably d. Yes, exclaimed Fletcher. Death, to be sure, I can guess it all. Death is approaching, and I feel that a solemn duty devolves upon me, namely, that of acquainting Matthew Fletcher, my heir, with the spot where I have hidden my savings. Go on, go on. All in good time, my friend, I laughed. You observe we can confirm a guess as to the sign right parenthesis being used for D by comparing the passage two nine double S dash right parenthesis star eight two two eight G which we now read T dot had better dot but T dot had better is awkward. You cannot make nine into O to had would be no sense. Of course not burst forth Fletcher. Don't you see it all? I had better let my excellent nephew know where I have deposited. Wait a bit, interrupted I. You are right, I believe. I is the signification of nine. Let us begin the whole cryptograph now. Dash n dot t e t h i dot i dot t dot r e dot i n d dot e. Remind me, cried Fletcher. You have it again, said I. Now we obtain an additional letter, besides M, for T dot remind me is certainly to remind me. We must begin again. Note T H I dot I dot to remind me. This is, called out my excited friend, whose eyes were sparkling with delight and expectation. Go on, you are a trump. These, then, are our additional letters. 
colon dash right parenthesis equals d seven equals m beta equals s nine equals i lambda equals o to remind me i dot i dot e e dot m dot death n i dot h for m dot death i read my death and i dot i dot e e dot i guess to be if i feel so it stands thus note this is to remind me if i feel my death night that i had better i worked on now in silence fletcher leaning his chin on his hands sat opposite staring into my face with breathless anxiety presently i exclaimed halves met i think you said halves i i i i my very dear fellow i a very excellent man was your uncle a most exemplary all right i know that said fletcher cutting me short do read the paper i have a spade and pick on my library table all ready for work on the moment i know where to begin but really he was a man in a thousand a man of such discretion such foresight so much down came fletcher's hand on the desk do go on he cried and i could see that he was swearing internally he would have sworn ore rotundo only that it would have been uncivil and decidedly improper very well you are prepared to hear all all by jove by jingo prepared for everything then this is what i read said i taking up my own transcript quote, note this is to remind me if i feel my death nigh that i had better move to birmingham as burials are done cheaper there than here where the terms of the necropolis company are exorbitant fletcher bounded from his seat the old skinflint miser screw a very estimable and thrifty man your great-uncle confound it all stingy and he slammed the door upon himself and the substantive which designated his uncle and now the very best advice i can give to my readers is to set to work at once on the simple cipher given there the commencement of this paper and to find it out end of chapter two recording by christine g in oslo norway the third of march two thousand and twelve